Friday morning. Uh, All right, please turn your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 34. And I need, I need, I especially need some prayers today. My mind has been like all over the place this last week. Um, I don't know if any any of y'all came to our uh, our blowout that we had, but we had Pastor Mike Fernandez. uh, We had him preaching and. He kept saying, when he was talking about Peter, he was all, all over the board, all <laughs> over the board. So I, f- I feel like my mind has been all over the board this last week. So um, he'll also fold me in a pretzel. He's a black belt in jiu-jitsu, so please pray about that as well if he ever sees this. Um, Deuteronomy 34. If you have Deuteronomy 34, give me an amen, please. Amen. Okay. I got all kinds of papers this week. I'd, I need help. I need help this week. Help Help me this week, Lord. I need you. I need you. All right, Deuteronomy chapter 34, and we will look at verse 5. Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. The Bible says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. And he buried him in a valley in the land of Moab, over against Beth Peor. But no man knoweth of his sepulchre unto this day. And Moses was an hundred and twenty years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him. And it is the Lord commanded Moses. And there arose not a prophet since in Israel like unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, and all the signs and the wonders which the Lord sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh, and to all his servants, and to all his land, and in all that mighty hand, and in all the great terror which Moses showed in the sight of all Israel. Then skip with me one page over to Joshua. We're going to look at chapter 1, first couple verses of Joshua. Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Let's pray. God, my Father, Lord, I need you now more than ever before. Um, I I need the filling of the Spirit, Lord God. I know for a fact, um, and you know that no one is here to get anything from me at all. On the contrary, Lord, if if any of that happens, this has been an utter failure, Lord. I need words from you, Lord God. I'm going to open my mouth today in faith, believing that you will fill them with the words that you want preached. And I pray all this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right, so we have here the death of Moses, and Moses, as most of you know, had been leading uh, the children of Israel for quite some time now. They were getting close to the promised land, but uh, because Moses messing up with smiting the rock that second time, he wasn't allowed to go in. So Moses is about about to die here, and we see that someone picks it up after Moses. Next man up here was Joshua. And so what I want to look at today is, you know, it's, it's funny how the Lord works, how whenever it seems like pastor's gone this weekend, more people show up. <laughs> Lord has a funny sense of humor like that. So Gene Kim is not here today. So if you're here to see anything other than um, what God has for you today, by all means, please don't be here to see anything from me. It needs to be from God today. Amen. And so what, what, I, what I have for you today, and I hope that it's a blessing and it helps you, is Anyone who wants to be used by God, who wants to be used by God, we're going to look at Joshua today, and we're going to see some things from his life, things that he did, that hopefully we can glean and learn from so that God can use us. Because our life is as a vapor, amen? Amen. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, amen? Amen. God forbid, pastor could... Pastor could not come back. He could he could die on the way over. He could be called to be. I mean, watching him at the he was at the youth rally this last week, and it was almost like a it was almost a weird moment 
where I felt like a little kid watching my dad, like, have fun with another kid. Yeah. I was like, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. it was a blessing, but I was like, hey, that's, that's my pastor, you know? <laughs> come back here. Come back here. Like, yeah, go have fun for a week, but we need you here. But um, the, the reality is that's not promised, you know? Yeah, Lester Roloff, he died flying his plane. And how did his people pick up that mantle after he left it? If Gene Kim wasn't the pastor of San Jose Bible Baptist Church, would all of you still come to church? Would you find the first excuse to not go to church? Or, oh, the next, you know, the next King James Bible believing church is this far away. I, I can't make it that far. How far are you willing to go? What are you willing to do? And who are you willing to be for God to be able to actually use you? Because God will use someone. If it wasn't Joshua, it would have just been someone else. <laughs> yeah, amen. Joshua wasn't anything special. I'm nothing special. No, no one here is special. Amen. But it's not because we're special that God can use us. Yeah. Yeah. It's because we do certain things. So today we're going to be looking at the man that God uses. And the first thing I want you to see about this man that God used Joshua is uh, in verse 1 where it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister. Did it say God's minister or Moses' minister? It said Moses' minister. So Joshua, he was busy ministering to the man of God. Minister, it's funny how Brother Stan, he was preaching on, on money and on being a faithful steward. And he defined, this was on at Bible study, being a steward is just someone who manages someone else's stuff. Like they're, they're trusting you to take care of their money, their house, their whatever they trust you with. Minister is very, very close to that word. It means a chief servant. Hence, an agent appointed to transact or manage business under the authority of another in which sense it is a word of very extensive application. So we see that before Joshua could come, become the man of God, the man that God would use, he had to become useful to Moses. He had to minister to Moses. And so that's the first thing about the man that God can use, is he's a help to others. He's dependable. He's known as a minister. Are you known as a minister? Are you known as someone that will go out of the way to help someone else? Are you, are you, is pastor able to trust you to do certain things that uh, he asks you to do or that you volunteer for? Are you dependable? Some are able to have faith in God. They're to the point where their faith is good. They have that shield of faith, amen? Yeah. And they're able to block some of those fiery darts throughout the week. And they're able to believe in God that everything's going to be okay. But there's a balance to where some people go so far that they're able to have all this faith in God, yet God is not able to have any faith in them. What I mean by that is, what I mean by that is, th there go, and I'm preaching to myself right here. This is me. Faith has never been an issue for me. I don't know why. I just believe God can do crazy stuff. I don't, I don't care. But where that goes too far is where you go, oh, God will take care of it. God will just take care of it. And that's one of the ways that the devil will tempt you. He'll tempt you to do nothing and just, oh, just let God take care of it. Joshua didn't do that. Joshua, he was as close to the man of God as possible. He ministered to him. He not only had faith in God, but he, all, God could have faith in him. God could trust him to do certain things. He was a minister. He was a chief servant that God could trust to take care of the children of Israel after Moses had passed. What if Gene Kim never came back? Who, what would happen to this church? And please don't look at me because I'm not that guy either. I pray and I wish that if something like that happened, I would be able to, but I can't tell you for sure I would. So don't look to me. Don't look to Rob. Don't look to Tom. Don't look to anyone else. Yeah, amen. This is about you looking in yourself and saying, like, be real with yourself. Am I here because, you know, I'm proud to be a part of this church. We have such a cool online ministry and the fellowship and the people are cool and it's a good brotherhood. Or are you here because it's the right thing to do and this church believes the right things? Because it only goes so far to come here because people are nice. That only gets you so far. Uh, so there was a, 
There was a man. Let me get over to my first thing here. One stormy night, an elderly couple entered the lobby of a small hotel and asked for a room. The clerk said they were filled, as were all the hotels in town. But I can't send a fine couple like you out in the rain, he said. Would you be willing to sleep in my room? The couple hesitated, but the clerk insisted. The next morning, when the man paid his bill, he said, you know, you're the kind of man who should be managing the best hotel in the United States. Someday I'll build you one. The clerk smiled politely. A few years later, the clerk received a letter from the elderly man, recalling that stormy night and asking him to come to New York. A round-trip ticket was enclosed. When the clerk arrived, his host took him to the corner of 5th Avenue and 34th Street, where stood a magnificent new building. That, explained the man, is the hotel I have built for you to manage. The man was William Waldorf Astor, and the hotel was the original Waldorf Astoria. The young clerk, George C. Bolt, became its first manager. So what do we have here? We got a guy who's just managing his little, you know, out in the boondocks hotel. And it was a kind of like a Joseph and Mary situation. All the inns were full. They had nowhere but a stable to go. And the guy goes, look, I can't, I can't with a good conscience, you know, send you folks out in the rain. You know, I know it sounds weird, but, and I promise my last name's not Bates, but if you want to stay with me, you can stay in my room, and that'll keep you dry. So this guy wasn't doing anything special. He wasn't doing it to be seen of people. I'm sure no one even knew about it but him and that couple. And what happened? Later on down the road, because he was a faithful minister, and he was faithful, take, faithfully taking care of other people when he could, when it wasn't convenient, when you just got done at church all day and you're picking up, you know, groceries on the way home and you see, uh, you know, the Lord tells you to give a track to that person right when you're about to get in your car with the groceries and go witness to them. And you're like, okay, Lord, I just got, I was just at church all day. Like I, and he's like, okay, okay, all right, don't do it then. Don't do it. And then you're like, okay, all right, I'll go. And then they end up getting saved Amen. or you end up having like a great conversation or something. All it takes for you to be used by God is to be faithful Amen. in little, th seemingly little things where no one else is watching. Are you doing that? Pastor doesn't know, like, no, no one knows how much Bible you read. No one knows if you're actually praying every day. No one knows if you're actually memorizing the verses that we look at every week. But God knows. Yeah. And if you, if you think that those things aren't going to come back around one day, he said he's going to prepare a place for us. Amen? Amen. Yeah. So do you want to be the guy that's going to have the Waldorf Astoria? Or do you want to be the guy that has a room? Amen? Yeah. A room in glory. Yeah. I want to be a faithful minister that when God comes back, he can go, I built that for you right there. Yeah, that's that's yours. That's and so Joshua, we see he was a faithful minister. He was a faithful minister. Uh, not only was he faithful in his ministry, but he was faithful in his march. Look with me at verse 3. Verse 3. So following God, telling Joshua here, Moses is dead. Uh, I'm sorry, let's look at verse 2. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Verse 3. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses." From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So Joshua, he was faithful in his, in his march. His walk with God was a constant and it was a consistent one. God told him, wherever your foot treads, that I have given unto you. Can you imagine if Joshua would have only gone halfway? What if Joshua wouldn't have even started? Well, he wouldn't have gotten all that land that God had already promised to them. So God has so many ways that he already plans to use you if you would simply let him do so. And how you let him use you is you're just faithful in seemingly small things starting out, right? You that are here today, 
You have faithfully come to church. God can use you today because of you coming to church. If you don't come to church, it's probably going to be a lot harder for God to use you because you're not getting the preaching that you need. Yeah, amen. And faith cometh by hearing, hearing amen. by the word of God. Amen. amen. So Joshua, he was faithful in his march. He was steady. He was content. He was peaceful. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know bo both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ yeah. which strengtheneth me. Is that how you feel today? Yeah. Do you f honestly feel like you can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth you? How's your walk? Is it steady? You know, I, none of us, none of us are special. We all go through stuff all throughout the week. We go through our, we get the fiery darts. We're just trying to. Sometimes we can't even keep marching forward. We just gotta kind of hunker down and just hold that shield up, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean. But that's okay. It's okay to do that. What's not okay is to turn away from where you're marching. So we see here that Joshua, when he was ministering to Moses, he was just being faithful. He wasn't looking for the glory. Now when God tells him to go and march, he's just faithfully, he's just going to get going, and he's just going to be marching. doesn't matter what's standing in front of him. A lot of you get so stuck on looking at what's looking at you, what's in your way, rather than thinking about who's on your side. And knowing that they'll, it'll move out of the way if you just keep marching. Like when Moses, he told Moses, go pick up that snake by the tail. And Moses kept running from it, right? And he goes, no, turn around, look at it, go grab it. And when he finally had the courage to do so, it turned, in, turned back into the staff. God's got something like that in, for you in your life right now that you're running from. You're running from something that seems like a big old bad snake that's going to bite you. And you won't just turn around and look it in the eye and go, you know what? If God be for me, who can be against me? Amen. And that's where Joshua was at. How's your consistency? How's your consist consistency with your Bible reading, with your prayer, with coming to church, with, uh, with being a good husband, being a good father, being a good son, being a good daughter? Are you consistent? In your daily walk, are you marching consistently, or are you like 40, 40 yard dash one week, and then you, maybe you turn around and just get distracted, and you're just like walking out in the field the next week, and then you trip back over. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. This was the right path. Ah, and you go for like another week, and you're like, oh, is this is like high altitude or something. What's going on? Oh, this is hard. Yeah, it's hard because you stopped running for a week. You stopped just fit, keep a good pace, get that heart rate up. And you stopped, so it's obviously going to be harder because you're out of shape now. So you got to be faithful in your march. Second thing you got to be, if you can be faithful where God can start to use you, you got to be fixed on some things. Okay? The man of God has got to be fixed on some things. We see here that Joshua, he was fixed on his mission. Look at verse 6. This is God still talking to Joshua. He said, Be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only, he says it again, only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. So Joshua, he's got a job to do. He knows what the job is. Not only was he told by Moses, but God has confirmed this. God, he, God himself has come to him and said, yeah, what he was teaching you was right. What pastor was teaching you was right doctrine Amen. Come on. out of the right book. Yeah. But now what are you going to do with it? Yeah. I'm confirming, yes, that is true, what he did. But are you going to wait? for Moses ain't coming back. Well, I mean, he is in the tribulation, but he's not coming back for you, Joshua. Okay, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do now with what God has given you? So it's on Joshua. He's got to be fixed on his mission. I was told by Jesus Christ to preach the gospel. Okay, Amen. and I thank God that I have a pastor that helped me and put Amen. time in me and poured into me and built me up. 
but ultimately it's Jesus Christ that enables me to do anything I'm able to do. And it was only because I was faithful in the small ministries, in the small things, in my march daily, just trying to do what I could, that the Lord was able to use me and to where now, at least I like to think I'm fixed on some things. To the point where even if I get off this path, let's say I'm on this path and I get off, every second I'm turning, I'm like, oh, I shouldn't be off this path. Uh, I should, uh, I know what I should be doing. I'm without excuse now. So God has given you light. God has given you knowledge. God has given you the right book, right doctrine. He's given you everything you need. So now there's no excuse. It's on you to be fixed onto your mission. Like Joshua here. Joshua, don't turn there, but Joshua 24, where is it? 24, 15. Joshua, and if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Is that you? Is that you? Are you going to speak for your house? Or do you not speak for your house? If you don't, and your husband's not speaking for you, then that's a problem. You need to pray for him. You need to maybe try to show him scripture. But there's times in the Bible, like when Abram should have listened to, to Sarah, and he didn't, where if, if your wife is following God's will and you're not, you better watch out, man, and you better listen to her, or else you're going to get your family in a mess. You're going to get your family in a mess. You're on a mission, we need to be more militant as Christians. We're not here for fun and games. Like, praise God that he's blessed us with so many wonderful things we can enjoy. But we are pilgrims and strangers in a strange land. I do not belong here. I especially don't belong here in this building. Okay? All right? I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm just trying to get home. Okay? And it's our responsibility to grab as many people as we can on the way home. So you got to be fixed on that mission. Joshua, he's not going to backslide, okay? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Man, how did Joshua get set up like that? He was just, there's no secret to it. It's not like he did anything special. He was just faithful. He was faithful in the little things, faithful to the man of God. He submitted to his pastor. Do you submit to your pastor? Or do you always question what he does behind his back? Come on, Come on. Breathe, brother. Breathe. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Very good. I therefore so run... Not as uncertainly. I don't, it's not like I'm running like, oh, I hope I get to heaven. Oh, I hope that what I believe in is right. No, I know that I know that I know I know the truth. Amen. So I'm not running Amen. uncertainly, okay? I yeah. know what this is about. Yeah. So fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it unto subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. So you need to be fixed on that mission. You need to be fixed running your race, running for that prize, running for the high calling, and it can't be because of Gene Kim. It can't be because of San Jose Bible Baptist Church. It can't be because your dad told you to or your husband or your wife or anyone else but you. At the end of the day, it's going to be you and Jesus Christ, and you're going to have to give an account for what you did with what he gave you. We are all without excuse. So what are you doing? And another thing, be fixed to run your race. Yeah, that's good. Don't run my race. Yeah, come on. And I'm not going to run pastor's race. Yeah. And pastor's not running Dr. Ruckman's race. Yeah. Right. We all have our own race to run. God has put each and every one of us in particular situations with certain circumstances, certain strengths and weaknesses so that we could relate to someone that that someone else can't relate to. Amen? Amen? Do you have that resolve? 
do you have that resolve that you're going to stay on your mission, you're going to be fixed, and you're going to follow God? Not the man of God. Follow the man of God as long as he follows God. And thank God, I've never had to question if, if my man of God was following God. Amen. Ever. Amen. Ever. But what if the man of God is taken out of the way? Who are you going to follow then? We're not a cult. We don't follow a man. We follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And as long as that man is following God, just like Paul said, be ye followers of me, as I am a follower of Jesus Christ, then I'll follow Paul. I'll follow Pastor Kim. What if he fell? You ever think about that? Anyone who's been here long enough uh, has heard Pastor say that. Pastor said, what if I fell? You know he could fall, right? Yeah. Yeah. I know as, uh, as crazy as that seems, he's like the purest guy. It even makes you feel weird sometimes how pure he is and how filthy you feel when you talk to him. But he could fall too. So I'm trying to be real with you today. I'm trying to, sh to break down. I pray to God it's not some kind of idol, but I'm trying to break down any false notion that everything's just going to be okay and he's always going to be there because he's not always going to be there. There's a story told that Andrew Jackson's boyhood friends just couldn't understand how he became a famous, famous general and then the president of the United States. They knew of other men who had greater talent but who never succeeded. One of Jackson's friends said, Why, Jim Brown, who lived right down the pike from Jackson, was not only smarter, but he could throw Andy three times out of four in a wrestling match. But look where Andy is now. Another friend responded, how did there happen to be a fourth time? Didn't they usually say three times and you're out? Sure, they were supposed to, but not Andy. He would never admit he was beat. He would never stay throwed. Jim Brown would get tired, and on the fourth try, Andrew Jackson would throw him and be the winner. Picking up on that idea, someone has said, the thing that counts is not how many times you are throwed but whether you are willing to stay throwed. Amen. We all have setbacks. We all fall. I stopped coming to church for years. Tom stopped coming to church for years. We know how hard it is. We know how hard it is to get back in. And by, when I came back in, pastor, he didn't let me just come up and preach the first day. He didn't just start giving me responsibility after responsibility. I had to show myself a faithful minister doing the little things that no one would notice that he would ask of me time and time again until I could earn that trust back. And so it's okay. Like I'm not up here saying I've never been thrown. We are all thrown around all the time. But there is no reason you have to stay thrown. And that is one thing the devil's going to use, uh, use on you is that guilt, that shame, and that discouragement of like, well, Lord, I just I fell so bad this last time. I, there's no way you can use me anymore now. Not after this last time, Lord. No, he can. Yeah. He Lord, can yeah. and he will. He yeah. will. He used Samson that last time, didn't he? Yeah. After he messed up, yeah. he used him in a big way, amen? Yeah. Yeah. If for no other reason you uh, got to tear down a building with a bunch of yeah. idols and pagans and whatever, spiritually, of course, then he can use you. He can use you one last time. But there's no excuse. It's not like he's not going to use you. He can use you. But you have to let him. And you have to be fixed in your mission, no matter how many times you fall, to just get back in it. Next thing he was fixed on, Joshua was fixed in his meditation. Look with me. Go back to our main text in Joshua chapter 1. Joshua chapter 1. And we're going to look at... Verse 8. We're going to look at verses 8 and 9. Joshua was fixed in his meditation. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. The Bible says, this, and this is God still talking to Joshua, This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, Amen. that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Verse 9, Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, 
Neither be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Joshua, he was meditating therein day and night. He's in the book and he's on his knees. He's faithful. He was faithful to Moses. Then Moses is taken out of the way. What does he do? He steps up. God comes to him and says, will you do this? And he says, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll follow you, Lord. He's marching. He's faithful in his march. He's fixed on his mission. He's like, I'm gonna do, I got to do this. I don't care if it costs me everything. I don't care. Me and my house, we're serving the Lord. We're doing it. And, and he's finally, he's fixed in his meditation on the word of God. He's on his knees. He's praying. He's reading the word of God day in and day out. That's bolstering up his faith. It's giving him more strength. It's giving him more courage. And that is how you're going to be able to be strong and have courage. It's not going to be by your own will or your own power. God said that his strength is made perfect in weakness. So it's the times where you're lowest. You're at your lowest point and you have nothing. You're crying over books. You're in the book of Psalms. You got nothing going for you, but you're just reading. You're just meditating. You're talking to God. You're saying, Lord, how can I, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. And he'll do it. He will get you through it. Turn over to 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4. It's not some, it's not, what I've learned is it's not some secret thing. There's not some secret road to spirituality. It's the easiest thing in the world, which makes it hard. It's you with a good heart, spending your time in the book, spending your time on your knees, spending your time on other people and not yourself. Amen. Your problem is you don't want to be used by God. You want to be you. Yeah. You want to be yourself. You want to do what you want to do, don't you? That's the problem. That's why we're in Laodicea. We're in the time of the rights of the people. Everyone is so concerned about my rights, my rights, my rights, that you're not looking at your liberty that you have in Jesus Christ. What? Your liberty to serve. That's what your liberty is talking about is that you have been freed from the shackles of sin. You're not going to hell. And so because you've now been freed, you ought to walk in newness of life and free other people. Amen. That's why you're here. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I'm sorry, verse 6. 1 Timothy 4, verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Did you hear that? Nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. Where do we get good doctrine? Come on. From the words of faith. Amen. The King James Bible. Amen. So you're not going to be nourished up if you're not in the Bible. Yeah. You're not going to get good words yeah. unless you're in the Bible. And you're not going to get good doctrine unless you're in the Bible. It's very simple. And it's so simple, it'll drive you crazy. Amen? Because <laughs> there's no way around it. There's no shortcuts. But it's so perfect because, I mean, you'd be surprised, and especially talking to these little kids and doing, sun doing Sunday school last week with these kids, I go to explain the Garden of Eden. Sister Iris is translating. And it, before I can even start explaining the first flashcard, they all start, talk they all start talking and explaining everything. She trans She translates, she goes, yeah, they know what it is. <laughs> they said they are sinners and they're in the garden and they ate the fruit and they're. And I was going, I look at Sister Iris, I go, okay, so they already know everything we're about to try to teach them. She's like, uh huh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's a blessing. Amen. That is a father and a mother that are meditating in the word Amen. with their children, have said, for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And those are the type of people that God can use. Amen. Humble people with a good heart that are willing to spend time with him. It's no different than if, you're, if, you're, if your father has two kids, one of them wants to spend all their time with him, the other wants to go out and do whatever. Yeah, they're still both his kids. He still loves them both. But you don't think he's going to be closer to one than the other? Yeah, amen. That gets into the fellowship between us and God. Uh, 
back here to verse 7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life which now is, and of that which is to come. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach. Why? Because we trust in the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. These things command and teach. Do you know how you command and teach? Out of this. Yeah. Yeah. Out of this. Amen. You can't get around this book. Amen. You cannot get around it. You can't beat it. Sometimes when we're out street preaching, I'll just hold it up and I'll just say, can't beat this book. Amen. Can't beat this book. Amen. And you'd be surprised. People get, they get scared. They get freaked out. They run. Like, this guy's crazy. So you need to meditate in the word, all right? You want God to use you? You need to meditate in his word. You need to love spending time with him. And you need to depend on him and his words. That's what Joshua did. Joshua depended on God. That's how he was able to serve him so well. Proverbs 3, 5, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. Amen. And he shall direct thy path. Amen. That is the secret. You want the secret? Stop trying to, just like I said, don't just sit there and do nothing and say, God will take care of it. God will do everything. Amen. At the same time, don't try to do everything yourself. You need to lean on God and he will direct you. Wait for him to tell you what he wants you to do. I'm not, I'm not kidding. It, it's happened before. When I was watching pastor at that youth meeting, I was, wa yeah, I got a little jealous, like I was saying, what, but I was, also, I was also thinking to myself, man, all the people, this guy should be preaching in front of thousands of people. And I mean, you know, praise the Lord he is online, but I'm talking, this guy should be a traveling evangelist. This guy should help, he could be able to help so many people. And what, we just want to keep him in this room with 25, 30 people? I started thinking about that. I'm like, man, what if he was called to do something bigger? What if he was called to do, I mean, you know, Billy Graham is one thing, but what if he was called to do some kind of thing where he was going around just preaching to people, helping them? What would happen? What would happen to our church? Who would fill in? Could he trust anyone to fill in? The people that are in their current roles, could it be trusted that they would step up to a higher role and the people that are just attending would step up and fill those other slots? Wow, you ought to think about stuff like this. It's like when, when your wife asks you, what would you do if I died? <laughs> would you? And but just so you know, gentlemen, the correct answer is always, I would find the nearest gutter. I would wallow in sackcloth and ashes. I would not eat again, and I would die of starvation in a broken heart. Amen, Brother Stan? <laughs> Amen. Amen. But this is real life. What would you do if something happened to pastor? What would you do if he wasn't there? Would this church just crumble, and everything he worked for, and everything the Lord blessed him with, would it just crumble and turn to naught? Or would someone take up the mantle? Could God find a Joshua? in this church and ask him to go over with those people. My last point, my last point, the man of God that can be used, he's a man that's followed. Turn back to Joshua 1, our main uh, text. Joshua 1, and we're going to look at verse 10. We're going to look at verse 10. While you're turning over there, I'm going to share another. Uh, I'm going to share another illustration. So Joshua one, take your time going over there, verse ten. <clears throat> but this goes into actually, I missed this one, but this is good about your faithful march, right? Just doing little things faithfully. Norman Gessler, as a child, went to a. I think this is Daily Vacation Bible School, DVBS, because he was invited by some neighbor uh, neighborhood children. He went back to the same church for Sunday school classes for 400 Sundays. Each week he was faithfully picked up by a bus driver. Week after week he attended church but never made a commitment to Christ. Finally, during his senior year in high school, after being picked up for church over 400 times, 
he did commit his life to Christ. Now the question is this, what if that bus driver would have stopped at 395 times? What if he would have gone, you know what, this kid is, I mean, this kid's been coming for years. He never, he's, I think he's, I don't know if, why he's there for free food or the other kids or something. I'm done. I'm done. But they didn't. Somewhere in history, I don't know where this was, at some time, there was a Joshua just driving the bus, just driving the bus, faithfully, week in and week out. So what would happen if you, I don't know where you are right now, but whatever you're doing, if you stop right now, who's to say who could have gotten saved? Who's to say what you could have done for God? And it's not like some mystery where we're never going to know. We are going to know. Yeah. It's going to be shown. It's going to be shown in front of everyone at the judgment seat of Christ. So hang in there, okay? Hang in there and keep faithfully doing what you're doing. That's how God will use you. Verse 10, Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people, this is after um, the Lord just got done commanding Joshua to do all these things. There's no pause. Joshua doesn't question it. <clears throat> he doesn't question him. He's not like Moses where he says, Lord, I can't talk. I don't, I don't have a good mouth. And God goes, who made your mouth? Who made your mouth? God made his mouth. Joshua was better off than Moses in this regard. All it says is, then Joshua, he got up, Joshua commanded the officers of the people saying, pass through the host and command the people saying, prepare you victuals for within three days, ye shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land, which the Lord, your God giveth you to possess it. And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to the half tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. Um, skip down with me to verse 16. And they answered Joshua, saying, All that thou commandest us we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us we will go. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. So lastly, the man that God uses is followed. In Joshua, we see here, he was followed. And the reason he was followed is because he faithfully served Moses all those years. That's right. And those people were able to see Joshua attached at, the, at Moses' hip, just faithfully serving him. Yep. <clears throat> and then they're able to see once Moses is out of the way, now they're looking, okay, now what do we do? Now who do we follow? Now what's going on? God comes to Joshua, talks to him. Joshua, he's unapologetic. He doesn't get up and go, um, I, I think I might have an idea. I, I mean, I know I'm no Moses or anything, but... No, he gets up confidently. Why? Because he know God just told me this. I'm just giving you what God told me. And so that's all I'm doing today. And I'm not asking you to follow me. So this should be very easy. You're not supposed to follow me. I'm asking you to follow God, what he said in his book. And I have the words. I have the proof. It's very easy to do. So if you want to be used by God, you need to follow you need to be a good follower so that when the time comes, God can lift you up and then you can be followed. Does that make sense? Yeah. Amen. Problem is, everyone wants to be the chief and no one wants to be an Indian these days. Yeah. No one wants to be a follower. Yeah. Everyone goes, well, I've been, coming, I've been coming to church. I've been coming for this many months now. I've been coming for this many months. This guy only came a month ago. Brother Rod, he's only been saved a year. And he's already out doing everything. Pastor, like, he's like the tech roadie guy. He like street preaching, does a sign. He does everything. He's all over the place. I've been coming for years. What about me? Does that voice sound familiar? Why would someone follow you when you can't even follow? Does that make sense? Joshua was followed because he knew how to follow. 
are you, are you even in a point where you can follow? I'm not even asking you about someone following you. Can you follow today? If you can't follow someone else, it's no wonder you have a dead Christian life. Come on. You don't want to be used. You want to be you. You don't want to follow the man of God who's faithfully following God. You want to follow whatever sin you're into or whatever fleshy thing you'd rather do than serve Jesus Christ. You need to get that right with God. He's coming back soon. What's that bumper sticker that Brian Kelly has? Jesus is coming back soon, and boy, is he mad. (laughs) He's mad because in this dispensation, he's stuck on the other side. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. He's He's supposed to be in with us. And thank God as a Christian, he is inside of us. Yeah. But di- dis- as, as far as this age goes, he's trying to get in the churches. But there's so many people flooding the churches, these mega churches, and, and paying all this money. There's no God in it. Jesus can't even fit through the door. we got a bunch of people that can't follow another man. We got a bunch of kids that can't follow their parents. Come on. We got a bunch of wives that can't follow their husbands. And we got a bunch of men that can't follow God. Yeah. And it's a shame. Amen. It's a shame. My last thing. My last thing I got for you. S.I. McMillan, in his book, uh, None of These Diseases, tells a story of a young woman who wanted to go to college. But her heart sank when she read the question on the application blank that asked, are you a leader? Being both honest and conscientious, she wrote, no, and returned the application expecting the worst. To her surprise, she received this letter from the college. Dear applicant, a study of the application forms reveals that this year our college will have 1,452 new leaders. We are accepting you because we feel it is imperative that they have at least one follower. I was filling out, uh, I had to do this personality test for a job application once. And it was asking all kinds of weird questions. It was asking all kinds of weird questions. Like, questions like that. I just, I just have to lead. It was stuff like that. It was like, if there's a problem, you can... Uh, Everyone will be circled around me, and I'll be leading. Like weird stuff like that. And I'm just going through them like, I'm just going, I'm going through them thinking to myself, man, that is, anyone who would say yes to that is, that is embarrassing. I was like, no, 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 no. And uh, there's ones like, you know, at the party, I'm the center of attention. And I'm like, well, I'm not at the party, so that's not me. <laughs> and then someone was like, I just hate big crowds. Yes, yes, yes. Amen. <laughs> I was just honest. I, I'm, I don't need a job that bad to try to sit there and let me come up with the right answer. When I was a kid, I used to do that. My dad would get so mad at me, and he would go, stop telling me what you think I want to hear and tell me the truth. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Because kids will do it. Yeah. You parents know that. Yeah. Kids are little manipulators, man. Yeah. They will do and say whatever they need to. My dogs know how to do it. Yeah, amen. Yeah, that's right. Forget kids. My dogs know how to do it. And so we got a bunch of people that are sitting here wondering, why won't God use me? Why can't I do that? Why why does he have that ministry and I don't have that ministry? How come he's allowed to do that and I can't do that? How come pastor doesn't trust me with this? Maybe because you're too busy wanting to be the leader. And you're not willing to be the follower. And we got so many leaders these days, we got no one to follow the leaders. Yeah. Amen. So you want to be used? You got to be faithful. Are you faithful? That is good preaching, by the Are way. you faithful? I'm pre- <laughs> I pause so long because I'm like, oh, yeah. Lord's like, yep, preach it yourself, preach it yourself, preach it. Are you faithful to fold the laundry when you say you will to your wife? Are you faithful to pick up the things at the store that you said you would? Are you faithful when you say, I'll be there at this time? Or is it every time there's a, there's a gap? Every time. 
it's funny how unsaved like sports teams i had coaches that would be like if you're early you're on time if you're on time you're late and you'll do that for work too Mm -hmm. but when it comes to jesus i don't know what's wrong with us man oh jesus you understand no he doesn't you're wicked you're wicked and you think that God's just going to overlook all the times that you fall short where thank God he will when you come to him later on and ask forgiveness but you're just thinking everything's just going to be okay oh no God will take care of all my God will take care of my sin God will take care of my flesh God will take care of this 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 I'm just going to do me God made me like this I'm going to do me I'm going to keep cussing God made me like this he knows how I am I don't want to lose my ministry with all the hoods with all the gangsters I don't want to lose my ministry with, you know, my friends that got tattoos, so I'm going to roll up the, I'm going to have the short sleeves so I can still show my tattoos. Oh, that's good. You're, you're willing to compromise when it comes to you still doing what you want to do. Yeah. Figuring out a way for you to still do what you want to do. But when it comes to you doing the inconvenient things, having someone stay in your room when it's rainy outside, I wouldn't even, I, I know my, I wouldn't even try. Thank God for that guy. I wouldn't even try. I know there's, yes, I should rule my house well, but I know there's certain things. If I offer some strangers to sleep in my house, I'm going to be sleeping outside and they'll be sleeping in my house. We don't, we don't play that at our house. Doors are locked. We're ready to go. Every night could be an intruder. Is it paranoid? Probably, but we're prepared. Are you prepared? Have you been thinking, man, what if, pa- what if there was no pastor? What if Sean fell out of church again? What if Tom fell out of church? What if Brother Rob fell back into the world? Stan, he's already moving, so who cares about him? <laughs> Brother Jack. All of a sudden, Brother Stan comes up and preaches, and he slays it on Thursday. He's taking his talents to Boise. Yeah, right. Come on, man. <laughs> Come on now. But the point is, it's who are you looking at? Who are you looking to follow? Don't let it be anyone other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And I pray that if you would humble yourself, be faithful in little ministries starting out, be faithful. If all you can do right now, you're getting so beat up in the week, all you can do is barely get yourself to church, praise God. Like I said, there's no shortcuts. Just like there's no shortcuts, God knows your heart. So it's like on one end, on one aspect, we're going to give all, we're going to give God all the benefit of the doubt. Oh no, he's fi- I'm sure he's fine with me doing this. He's fine with me doing that. But then when it comes to actual genuine, sincere things, like you've been struggling with the things you've been struggling with and you can barely get to church, then you're going to let that voice get in. We're like, ah, how could, I mean, I shouldn't even go. Why am I going? God can't use someone like me. I don't even do the things I used to do. I don't even pray for people like I used to anymore. I don't even read my book. That's the devil. You've got to be able to recognize that voice is not you. Just keep doing what you're doing and wait for God. Promotion doesn't come from the east, the west, the south, but God. He's the one that promotes, okay? So I don't know why God does this when pastor leaves. I don't know why he gave me this. I don't know why more people come, but I know he does it for a reason. And I think that today the reason was because it, I mean, it, it, it makes it make more sense. Pastor's not here right now. Yeah. And I thought, as, we were, as I was getting ready to preach, I'm like, oh, man. Why does it, I was like, the spirit was so good. Everyone's just, Rob's walking around. I don't know. I just feel like the Lord's going to move today. I don't know. <laughs> but, Brother Tom, I, it seems like when pastor's here, it's actually more spiritual. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> I'm just like, oh, no. I'm like, okay, Lord, I know you must have it for some reason. But I thank God for this church. I thank God that there's people that you can tell this is real. We're not here because of Gene Kim, the doctor from Berkeley and PBI. Praise God for him. I praise the Lord for him. There's so many people that have him to thank for salvation, for everything. And I have, so, I have him to thank for so much. And he, and he would agree with me. He's just a man. He's just a sinner like me. And I'm just a sinner like you. But if you'll be faithful in serving the man of God, faithful in serving other people, ministering to them, God can set you up. God can use you. And then someday, who knows, once you've followed for a while, 
He might set you up. And then when that time comes, don't question it. Amen. Don't be all timid and shy. If God has given you a call to do something, do it. Yeah. And do it well. Do it heartily with everything you got. Every head bowed, every eye closed, please. The altar calls open. Altar calls open. I'll try to make it quick. Until you've, until you've preached, it's, it's a really weird feeling, but you have, maybe some of you think I'm preaching right at you. I have no idea who I'm talking to. All I know is what God put on my heart, what he told me to say. So I have no doubt that it's hitting somebody. If you've been thinking for some time, why isn't God using me? You need to check yourself on these things. You need to check yourself on, I mean, it, can God use me? Am I being faithful? Am I meditating in his word? Am I following him? Am I, am I doing what I can? Am I letting him use me? God can literally use anyone for his glory. And he'll use you if you let him. If you let him today. I'll tell you who God cannot use. I mean, he can use you for his glory, but it's not going to be the way you think. The Bible says, It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this the judgment. God is holy and he is just. He cannot lie. He's not a man that he should lie. And when Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, he wasn't lying. Jesus Christ is the only way to, come, to go to heaven. The only way to approach God is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you saved? Have you let the Lord Jesus Christ save you from hell today? If you haven't, today is the day of your salvation. You can do it right here, right now. If you'll let him. If you'll let him save you from hell today, he can use you. The Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. It is so easy, it's so simple, that you're going to mess it up and overcomplicate it. You're going to think, well, it can't be that easy. i got to do this, or i got to do that. This guy just got done preaching me. i got to do all these things for God to use me. Yeah, once you get down that road, but until you are a son of God, until you let him first save you out of the muck and mire, and where you're headed, which is hell, he definitely can't use you. So I'm going to tell you how he can use you today. He can save you from where you're headed. And then he can pick you up, you can walk in newness of life, and you can do something for somebody else. This is how you go to heaven. Right here. A, you got to admit to God that you know that you're a sinner. And that ought to... That ought to hurt your heart. It ought to hurt you, the bad things you've done in your life, the fact that you're a sinner and there's nothing you can do to take that sin away. If you have sin stuck in you, that sin cannot go to heaven. That is why hell must exist, why sin must be punished, and why all sinners shall have their part in the lake with, which burneth with fire and brimstone. That's the bad news, friend. But the good news is that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. The Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. You can have your sin cleansed today. If you admit as a sinner within yourself, God, I know I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. B, you got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that he died for you on the cross. He shed his blood for you. He was God in the flesh. And the third day he raised himself from the dead. Do you believe that? If you believe that, then today, my friend, is the biggest, best, most important day of your life. Because all that's left is see, confess. Confess with your mouth. It literally takes 10 to 15 seconds of you having a humble heart and willing to follow God. Just what we were talking about. Willing to follow. Are you willing to follow Jesus Christ today? If you are, then I will help you, okay? You don't have to say it out loud. You can say it in your heart. 
but I want you to repeat after me the best way you know how in your heart. You say it like this within yourself. You say, dear God, I know that I'm a sinner. I'm sorry. I believe you, Jesus, died for my sins, and you raised from the dead. I believe you told me that if I put my faith in you, you'll save me from hell, and you'll take me to heaven. I accept your free gift, Lord. Thank you for dying for me, Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, heads bowed still. Like 30 more seconds, we're done. Heads bowed one last time. If you just said that prayer, you just made the biggest decision of your life. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have everlasting life. You can know that you have everlasting life by doing what you just did. God is not a man that he should lie, and he promised us he would take us to heaven if we put our faith in him. So if you did that today, everyone, heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Heads bowed, eyes closed, no one looking around. Would you slip up your hand, please, if you just said that prayer? We want to pray for you. We want to pray for you today, okay? Thank you so much for your honesty. Thank you so much. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for salvation through your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that um, this preaching, you used it, Lord God. I pray it was for your honor and glory. I pray above all things, I pray that you would uh, bless the fellowship, the teaching from Brother Tom. And above all things, I pray that you would come back and rapture us out of this wicked world yeah. just as soon as possible. Yeah. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Out of all the wrong doctrines that's happening in our day and age at the last days of the church as the apocalypse is coming even closer, the point of all this, friend, is that you won't be even able to grow in knowledge of the truth, in Bible-believing truth, until you get saved first. The most important question you have to ask yourself after watching all this is if you were to die today, are you 100% sure that you're going to go to heaven? Perhaps one of these wrong doctrines have affected you and you had the improper way of salvation. As you have seen before, the way to get saved is very simple. It's only simply salvation by grace alone without works through the Lord Jesus Christ in this Christian day and age. If you're not sure that you can go to heaven after you die, it's very simple to get saved. First of all, you have to understand that because of sin, God is a holy God, and He cannot even allow 1% of sin into heaven. So He has to judge sin with a burning hell. So it is very important that you got to realize how serious sin is, and you must repent. You might say, well then, I guess I have to clean up all my sins. I guess I have to go to church. I guess I have to get baptized. I have to, I have to be a good person. No, my friend, good works can never save you. Jesus is God who died, buried, and resurrected so that he can pay all the sins for you. You don't have to pay a single sin for yourself. So all you have to do as a repentant sinner is turn to what he did on the cross alone for your salvation. You might say, well, pastor, I do believe only on what Jesus did on the cross to save me. That's great. Then all you have to do is just say that to the Lord. You might say, well, preacher, I haven't prayed much before in my life. I don't know really how to say it to God. Can you help me out? Sure, you could say it this way. Dear God, I know I'm a sinner. As I repent, I put my faith that Jesus is God and that he died, buried and resurrected so that his blood can wash away my sins. I put my faith in that alone to save me, not my good works. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Congratulations, my friend, if you meant it with all your heart that you put your faith only on what Jesus did on the cross through his blood to save you, then you are saved. It's that simple, my friend. Now, my friend, it is important to grow in Bible-believing truth. You now know the truth. What are you going to do about it? As the apocalypse comes even more closer and Satan's about his 
to set up his kingdom even more. There are many souls dying and going to hell, and even many more churches out there who don't know right and wrong doctrine. It is up to you now on what to do. And go to our resources site, www.bbcenglish.org, and click on the resources link over there, and it'll give you everything that you need to grow in grace. The next step of your journey now is up to you. We've done our part giving you this movie. All of it was done for free by the love of the people. God bless you.